Hi, welcome to the next of our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. We're going to be getting into something more about how the universe works, um, what electricity is. And because we don't get to control the laws of the universe, because we live in the universe and however it works is essentially made for us, uh, we have to rely on a little bit more mathematics, a little bit more physics type stuff for this section of these videos. And so what I plan to do is to go into as much as I can how electricity is, although nobody really knows what electricity is at a, at a deep level, which involves some mathematics. And I've chosen to include the mathematics in the video to develop them as I go along, rather than make a separate series of videos on mathematics that are unrelated to it or steer you to some of the really excellent videos out there on basic stuff. Feel free to go look at those if you don't understand it. For those who know this, I apologize if this is a review but I figure this is sort of a better way to do it than, than to do it separately. So Coulomb's Law, what is it? Well, it's essentially given by this equation right here. Um, it says the electric field, and that's this E, um, is given by this equation right here, and we'll get into what that is. Uh, another part of Coulomb's Law, essentially, is that the force um, on a charge, that's what this Q is, is proportional to the size of the electric field and the size of the charge. So what does this mean? Something called charges Q create electric fields and the force on a charge in an electric field is proportional to the electric field itself and the size of the charge. And Let's get into what that is later, but let's understand Coulomb first. It turns out that Charles Augustine Coulomb uh, was born in the 18th century. He died early in the start of the 19th century. And he happened to be a military engineer who had fallen on hard times, and he couldn't buy his way into the Paris Academy of Sciences, the university he wanted to um, attend. So because he was poor, the only way he could do this was to win some kind of ma major prize competition, and prize competitions were really popular at this time. And he essentially entered a contest to make a better compass, because compasses were how ships navigated, naval power was the thing at that time, and so this was essentially a military prize. Um, he basically did this by hanging things from a very thin thread and measuring how much they rotated, and it turned out he had the the best device for measuring small forces in the world. It turns out that even, you know, hundreds of years ago he could measure forces as small as about two and a half billionths of a gram with this thing. And it turned out this thing was so sensitive it was, it was affected by small electrical charges and static on dry wintry days. So he used it to measure the force between electrical charges, and that's what he happens to be remembered for. Um, his device itself um, looks like this, and you can find the pictures online. Both of these pictures are from Wikipedia. This gets a little bit complicated. Um, what do we know about Coulomb's Law so far, if we look at this? Well, we know that we have two vectors, um, our M and our Q. And I've chosen those names myself, where our Q is the position of the charge, and our M is the point we're measuring at. Um, and I'm going to, because of translational symmetry, set our Q equal to zero by putting the charge, Q, down here right at the origin. Then the length of Q becomes zero and we can get rid of those two vectors and then we can write Coulomb's law this way. It turns out that when we do this we see that Coulomb's law generates a vector because the electric field is a vector so we're going to be generating vectors. That vector points in the direction of where we're measuring to. So if we want to measure at some point M out here, um, essentially we have an electric field or uh, the electric field vector pointing out away from the charge. That's what this says right here. And we know that it scales by the length, the, the inversely to the cube of the length of this vector. And we'll look more at that scaling a little bit later. But the important thing to note is that the whole thing that generates this electric field is the charge. And Q is the amount of charge. If you have more charge, you double the charge, make QA twice as big, you get two times the electric field. If you make QA ten times as big, you're going to get ten times the electric field. The electric field scales with the amount of charge. But, but what is charge? Well, now we need to look at another part of Coulomb's law, which is this force term. And let's say we've got another charge, Q sub B, and it's sitting out here at this point, M. What's going on with this? It turns out that this Q sub B, this other little charge here, is going to feel a force. The force is a vector. 
it points in the direction of the electric field, which is away, and the size of that force is proportional to how big that second charge is times the size of the electric field, which in turn we know is just proportional to QA. So what does this mean? There's a lot of math that's gets, this gets quite complicated, but in a really simple sense, what this means is charges put out force fields. Invisible force rays is the thing I like to call them. We call these invisible force rays generated by charges the electric field, and we give it the variable E, and we make it a vector because these forces push other charges in a particular direction. They only push on other charges. If something comes along here that doesn't have a charge, QB is equal to zero, the force is also equal to zero. So charges are things that only push on other charges. You may think, well, this seems kind of strange because my body's made of charges and I, I, I don't feel electric fields even though I've heard they surround me all the time. Well, it turns out that matter is composed of an equal number of positive and negative charges, so our bodies are continually being pushed and pulled the same amount by any electric fields they encounter, so the net force we feel is zero. So again, charges generate electric fields, these invisible force rays, so if you have a charge, it's putting these invisible force rays out in all directions. These invisible force rays only push on other charges. Other things don't feel them. It's very analogous to um, gravity, for example, where mass generates gravity, and gravity only affects things that have mass in a general sense. That, that's sort of doing a little bit of hand-waving, but that's the general idea. Uh, electric forces are much stronger than gravity, it turns out, if you do the calculations. Um, so charge is what generates electric fields. Electric fields are the invisible force rays that push on charges. If we also think about a charge right there at some point in space, this charge Q generates an electric field. We know that electric field has a direction given by a vector that has a length and a direction, which is simply the point the vector is at, r sub q, and so this point in space right here where I've drawn that is pointed at, let's draw our set of coordinate axes here, by the vector r sub q, and we know the electric field at some point r sub m, so let's write r sub m, to represent that point, essentially, is proportional to the difference between these vectors, in other words, that way, divided by the magnitude, the length of those vectors cubed. What this essentially does is it creates what's called a vector field. At every point in space, every value of r sub m that we can possibly map to, there's an electric field. At this point in space, Coulomb's law says the electric field points out that way. At this point in space, it points away from the charge out that way. At this point in space, it's going to be very, very big because look, this distance between these two charges is small and it scales inversely as the distance cubed. Um, divided by the vector, which turns out to be the distance square, as, as we'll see in a little bit. So the electric field at that point in space is going to be huge. Here, you've got something pointing away from the charge, and so on and so forth. This is a general idea, and Coulomb's law is something that creates what's called a vector field. Things that create vector fields map vectors onto every single point of space. So no matter where you are, this charge is creating a vector field which says the force another charge is going to feel if you know the size of the other charge. A vector field is an equation, Coulomb's law, that maps a vector onto every single point of space. If you go into MATLAB, the computer program I prefer to use, you can actually get MATLAB to calculate vector fields for you and plot what it really looks like. 
where the longer the vector, the larger the electric field, and I've given you the code I used in MATLAB. It's only five lines long here to do this, but this is what happens when you have a computer program plot that vector field out for you, because doing this by hand and calculating at a lot of points would be very, very tedious to do. Um, and it turns out you never see this when you get a homework assignment because it would just be too boring. But this is what charges really do, and so we don't talk about it very much because it's hard to do except with a computer. But with a computer, it's very easy to actually plot and map a vector field for a charge. So the Q of the charge would be right there with the vectors pointing out from it. So what have we figured out from Coulomb's law? We know we have an electric field. At each point in space, this vector R sub m basically says at any point in space I can point to with a vector R sub m where I'm measuring the electric field, we create a vector. That vector, the size of the electric field, the invisible force rate is proportional to the charge. We know it points in a direction that goes from the charge out to away from the measurement point because of this subtraction. So this is a vector that has a length um, of how far the measurement point is from the charge. And we know we also have a distance because there's the magnitude cubed in the denominator. So basically this is basically length 1 up here um, or to the first power linked to the third power down there as we see that's inverse square. But we have some terms we haven't explained down here 4 pi and epsilon. Let's take a look at the 4 pi right now and see where that comes from. So here's our, the equation that I just wrote up here. So I'm basically just going to copy this down here. But let's do some math to it. Um, let's basically um, put the charge at the origin, which makes the position 0, which I'm allowed to do through translational symmetry. That simplifies Coulomb's law over to this equation right here. It makes it easy. And now we've got a vector that has a, a, a direction and magnitude divided by the magnitude of that vector cubed. If I turn this and say, let's just write this as um, the length of the vector out, oops, let's make this a real length. That's not a very good length. I'm trying to draw parentheses. The length of the vector in the direction, a unit vector from where the charge is out to where we're measuring. In other words, here's the charge right here. And here's a point out here we're trying to measure. Um, so our vector r sub m goes from the charge out to where we're measuring. We can write that as the magnitude of that times a unit vector pointing in that direction because we know our idea of unit vectors. This cancels out of the numerator. This cube in the denominator turns to a square. And so I'm ending up, if I move my 4 pi around, with this equation right here. And now we see something interesting. We see in the denominator 4 pi r squared, where this is where what I'm calling r is the magnitude of the length of the vector squared. We recognize this as the area of a sphere, is 4 pi r squared. So why does that make sense? Where does this 4 pi come from? Let's take a look at a charge, um, q. And we know this charge, the way I like to think about it, is putting all these invisible force rays out in all directions like a porcupine. If I draw a sphere around this charge like that and pick some area, and I'm going to basically choose this, and I'm going to say this has an area equal to 1. It doesn't matter what unit it is. I'm just going to set it to 1. I could set it to 10. It doesn't matter. Um, You'll notice that this is just big enough for all these force rays to go through. There's a certain density or flux of force rays that goes through that area. But if I draw a bigger sphere, and let's call this radius um, r here. That's how, how big the radius of the sphere is. If I draw a second sphere and still keep my area to be 1, you'll notice that some of the force rays now miss. They don't go through the area. And if I draw still a third bigger sphere, and now notice my radius of this third sphere, R3, has increased, even more of the force rays don't go through that area. What this means is that the number of force rays per unit area scales as the size of this divided by the area of the sphere, because I know all my force rays are going to go through that sphere somewhere.
And this is a general case of what we call an inverse squared law. Things that scale inversely with the distance square, where r is the distance away from the thing that's happening. And we'll see this law over and over again, this inverse square law. But that's what the form of this form of 4 pi down here in Coulomb's law means, is it means that the charge puts off this whole host of invisible force rays. The invisible force rays go out and they spread out as they move away from the charge. And so the number that go through any unit area drops off inversely as the square of the distance. What this means is if there's a, another charge, let's call it QB out here, it's going to feel a force. But that force drops off as the square. So if it's one unit away, it feels a force of 1 over 1, or 1. If it's two units away, it drops off as 1 over 2 squared, or 4. If it's three units away, it's a ninth. If it's four units away, a sixteenth. And so essentially what this inverse square means is that things have to be pretty close to a charge in order to feel much of the invisible force ray. If it's far away, it doesn't feel very much force at all. So let's, let's wrap this all up. Let's summarize this. We have a charge that creates something we call an electric field, which is invisible force rays. Those invisible force rays, this electric field, essentially create forces on other charges something doesn't have a charge, the electric field doesn't affect it. Okay? There's no force on it unless it's another charge. The electric field itself points away from the charge, that's what the subtraction of vectors means, and it drops off inversely as the square of the distance because they have one distance here and distance cubed in the bottom, so it drops off as r squared. The 4 pi is there, because 4 pi r squared is the radius of the sphere, and we have this inverse dependence on, on, on distance squared, as we've seen. The only other piece that's left is epsilon. And epsilon is something called the permittivity, and it's just a constant that scales this equation so that everything works out in terms of the values. It happens to be a very, very small number, and we'll learn more about it later. But epsilon is just the constant at this point in time that keeps all these equations balanced so the units work out, so the forces are actually correct in what we measure. So to wrap up, charges create invisible force rays. They map uninvisible force ray to every point in space, creating a vector field. These invisible force rays only push on other charges. And because invisible force rays sounds pretty silly, we happen to call it the electric field because that sounds much more mysterious to those who aren't initiated into the brotherhood of electrical engineering.